Okay, thank you, Tim. So uh, as you see, the birth of, of Waypore, 1946-1950, okay? This is the father you bet. of, of, of uh, Waypore. 37, Harry, wasn't it? Uh, pardon? 1937. That picture? No, <laughs> when Harry came over. Oh, no, no. Let me tell you the story of that. So Good. Harry, Harry was in the, a uh, elite British public school in 1914, dropped out of school, joined the British Army. Good he heavens. Was, pardon? Good heavens, I said. Huh. Yeah. He, was, uh, a, he became a lieutenant a few weeks after his 17th birthday. He was a captain in the British Army before the, um, uh, during the four years that he served before he turned 20. And in his last year, he was in charge of training US troops when they joined the war. And then in 1919, he came over to the United States and he had a very varied career. He worked as a laborer, door-to-door -door salesman, uh, journalist, Publisher, publisher, author, and finally moved in the late 20s, early 30s into advertising. He met a gentleman called George Gallup, and he helped Gallup establish the. Uh, so we got something else showing up here. What noise? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, he, he met George Gallup and helped him found the Gallup affiliates in the UK, the first, in uh, France and in Australia. Then in 1941, he founded the National Opinion Research Center, next, at the University of Denver. That's the university library right there. And NORC was given the top floors as its offices, which had a wonderful view of the Rocky Mountains there. Next. Wow. And also had offices in uh, this hall, which used to be before the university turned into offices, a woman's dorm. Next. Then in 1944, uh, Harry had a new idea besides founding Nork, which was only three years old then. He had an idea about that the field should get together. And uh, so as soon as World War II ended in 1945, in the early 46, he started organizing this and uh, invited people. Um, matter of fact, the list, the initial uh, mailing list was uh, several hundred people. Uh, 73 eventually came to the Central City Conference on Public Opinion Research. Uh, July 29th to 31, 46. And it met in two locations. The one, it met in the Central City Opera House in Central City, next. And in the Teller House Hotel, which uh, did not have any private bathrooms. Uh, the attendees there had, they can use uh, uh, the bathroom at the end of the hall in this facility here. Next, it had a bar as any good hotel would. And on the bar, there was this painting here. And it goes along with a very famous 17 stanza poem, which if I had time, I would recite for you, but all about this, this woman, the face on the barroom floor. Next. Now this is the 12 sessions that were at the Central City. And many of them, as you look down at, are just what you would expect today. Wonderful. Technical ethic, yeah, te technical and ethical standards, interviewing problems, validity, sampling, and so on. Panels. Few, yeah, panels back then. Right. Yeah. And uh, a few that are not showing up anymore, like radio research, not quite the same place that it had back then. But look at the first session on there. The first session was public opinion and international affairs. And besides the technical side, the Central City Meeting had a great emphasis on international 
in comparative aspects. Next. Now, there were four resolutions that came out of this. And look at first, if you can see it, I'll read it. The one on in red at the top. Resolution, it is the sentiment of this conference that a second conference on public opinion research be held in 1947 and that a continuing committee of five elected by this conference be empowered to make arrangements for the 1947 meeting. And if we look at the bottom, we see that Harry Field, as the organizer of this conference, was also chosen to chair this uh, continuing committee, along with gentlemen such as George Gallup, Julian Woodward, Clyde Hart, and um, Lloyd Borg. Now look down at the blue one here. This conference favors the ultimate establishment of an international organization for the encouragement of public opinion research on a worldwide scale. This conference expresses its hope that foundation subsidies can be obtained to aid in the establishment of this world organization. The conference further asked the continuing committee, which I just introduced to you, to appoint a committee to implement this resolution. Next. Unfortunately, <clears throat> this process almost got disrupted when on September 4th, almost exactly a month after the ending of the Central City meeting, Harry Field died in an airplane crash in France after a tour of European survey research centers in Great Britain, the Netherlands, Belgium, and in France, in France, where he also met with UNESCO about the possibility of them supporting survey research internationally. But things did continue. Other people stepped up and took Harry's place. And in 1947, next, the second International Conference on Public Opinion Research was held in Williamstown, Massachusetts in September of 47. There, the World Congress on Public Opinion Research, its provisional constitution was adopted and its first president elected. So if you see there, our original name was the World Congress on Public Opinion Research. In the other meetings there, you see the fact that um, Wei Por, as its soon name soon became changed to, uh, set up meetings in Europe with Ezomar and then continued with joint meetings with Ezomar and with Apor over the years until we revised that about 10 years ago to exclude, uh, to include a third uh, meeting at some other location besides with Ezomar and wait for. Next. So this gives you a, a few facts. Uh, at the first meeting in Central City, which became named right after the, the continued committee renamed it right after the session ended as the first international uh, conference on public opinion research, which is why the one the next year became known as the second such conference. You see there were 73 attendees from five countries, 69 of the attendees were from the United States and um, four others. And then as you can see, there's a lot of question marks there, please, uh, numbers I hope to be able to find, but don't have yet. The number of attendees grew and the number of countries covered grew there. Uh, by the time we get to Williamstown, we town conference, we have 10 countries instead of five, and we have 179 attendees, uh, oh, 194, excuse me, attendees uh, in total there. Next. Now, these are some of the early leadership of Waypore. Uh, George Gallup is listed there because he was chair of the committee set up at Central City to uh, established the international organization. And then at this, at Williamstown, we have the first cons provisional constitution and the first president of the organization uh, elected. 
And you see there's a whole bunch of vice presidents uh, there. By the time you go to 48, uh, a little lower down there, there are, the vice presidents have all disappeared because they've now adopted a new organizational structure. Um, and we have the biennial uh, service of elected officials. Um, the first president under this new regime was William R. Wright, the mystery president of Way Park, um, and followed by uh, John F. Maloney. I call James Wright the mystery president of APOR because he was uh, in charge of the British military government public opinion unit in occupied Germany. And um, while he was there, he got caught up in some legal problems and uh, sent a note to Waypour saying that he was leaving the field of public opinion research. And that's about all we, we know about him, quite frankly. He just well, we know when he was president. We know when he was president, he didn't do anything. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We'll we'll see about that kind of thing. So, yeah, what were the main activities of Waypour in, in this period? Well, the big thing, the first category is getting organized. It had a past and it passed and revised and revised again constitutions. Okay. It pursued the idea of becoming incorporated, but never managed to do it. It coordinated with APOR and Ezomar, as I referred to earlier, and kind of set up the, uh, the uh, meeting structure. It, it did successfully hold conferences, although some of them were sparsely attended even by officers of it because travel was very difficult uh, back in that period. It found a journal for the uh, uh, publishing conference proceedings. And we'll hear a little more about that journal later in the talk. Uh, and then that journal um, uh, ceased to exist. And it did have some success in finding some funding from foundations to uh, promote foreigners coming to Waypoint conferences in the United States. It had three main projects. So most of its effort, as I just told you, was just in getting organized. Three main projects. It sought UNESCO funding for a barometer of international security, a world poll on um, peace and war and issues like that. Didn't succeed in getting that. But he did succeed in getting consulting status with UNESCO, although that took uh, into the mid 50s before that actually occurred. It tried to update the Cantrell and Strunk uh, compilation of all public opinion polls done in the period 35 to uh, 46, which was published during this period. But neither Waypour nor, any, nor anyone else ever succeeded in actually updating that. And it worked at developing standards but didn't actually get any standards developed during this period. So this was the start. And uh, uh, from that kind of wobbly start, uh, we've held on down the present day. You know the name Claude Robinson? Yeah. Haven't you got him to fit in? Uh, he was... Uh, he was uh, not really active early in, in Wayport. I know. Yeah. I know. He and George Robert, George Gallup, of course, were, were students at Northwestern and thought it was a good idea to have opinion polls and uh, they could write columns on them. And uh, Claude Robinson was uh, the head of... Uh, the Princeton arm of what they were doing uh, before the war. And he took, and Joe Beavis was the chairman uh, under Claude Robinson. And uh, he took me over to a restaurant, I think it was, or maybe it was an office, uh, to introduce me to George, George Gallup. It was the first time I knew him, it was 
57, I guess. Does that fit? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh... Oh, and of course, then they, they, joined, they joined together in 45 uh, to uh, this other, other agency. George Gallup and Claude Robinson were equal partners in it. Yeah, well, what a lot of people don't know is, is that Gallup had several businesses that he yep. organized there. Yeah. And the AIPO, which is popularly known as the uh, Gallup Poll, is uh, one. So he, he, you're up now, Bob. Our, our next uh, uh, presenter is, in fact, Bob Worcester, who is uh, going to speak about the builders of Waypore and IJPore. Bob, over to you. Well, um, APOR was, uh, of course, already founded and all of that. I didn't have much to do at all with it, but I certainly did have a lot to do with uh, IJPOR, uh, the uh, wonderful blue cover and all of that that uh, shows backwards to you, I guess, doesn't it? No, it looks good. It looks good, okay. Um, and uh, we had quite a ding dong. And uh, <clears throat> my co-editor, uh, co, what are we called? Founders, yeah, were Marty Lipset and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was saying, we're gonna have this German publisher have it. Uh, and I said, like hell we are. And we had a real ding dong, but luckily Mar I had a lot of support from Marty, who at that time was the uh, most cited political scientist in the United States and a jolly good guy. And we, uh, we beat her up and uh, that's how it came to be a uh, product, if you can call it that, not only of uh, the uh, Waypour, but of the uh, Oxford University Press. And they have, I believe, been extremely uh, generous, frankly, to, to us. And I was blown over when uh, I heard one year that uh, they were gonna raise the uh, kickback to Waypour from 50% of the profit, no, of the, of the income of uh, the International Journal. And they were kicking it up to 60%. And I didn't know anything else that I had, had knowledge of that, uh, that was so generous. And certainly being in the publishing business as I happen to be in now, I'm chairman of the uh, of a children's book company that's uh, Britannica Books in a deal with uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, who knocked it off, uh, knocked that part of their business over 12 years before we ran with it. And they said they'd rather do this. And my chief executive is up in Scotland today and has been for the last couple of days with the children's book on, uh, let's see, it's called, uh, It's Up to Us. And it's a children's book and it's all about uh, helping the environment. And this was the idea of the Prince of Wales. And Chris is up there now. Um, dealing with it and was on Sky Television for 18 minutes yesterday. I heard from him. Um, there was a very ticklish time though. And that time was uh, at the time that uh, Canada, uh, what's his name from Canada that was sitting right between Elizabeth and me? Anybody remember? 
I'll look it up here on my list. Uh, Ivan Corbey. Ivan Corbey. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> yep. Well, he had a bad habit and he uh, didn't send out any dues to anybody. And we found ourselves bankrupt at that time or very close to it, I'm not sure. Uh, but just at the same time, uh, I'd been approached by a nice chap, uh, Verstappen, his name, and he wanted to do a book called The Book of Numbers. And that book he published, and he described it as the, he was, he was not, not uh, uh, he, he, he didn't take a, back seat to anybody. The ultimate com compendium of the world's most fascinating facts and statistics. Now, what's that got to do with us? Well, uh, when one night we were at dinner with them and we got to talking about this kind of thing. And he uh, said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, if you can get a group of people who know what they're talking about, uh, to help and advise me on this, I could give you $25,000. So the uh, group ended up Julio Fio in Spain, uh, John Mayer at Irish Marketing Surveys, Pre Professor Dr. Elizabeth Noela Neumann, Unescopia Allensbach, of course, and then there was Helene Ruffo, and uh, Dick Scammon, I roped into it, and John Stapel, and Ann Zetterberg. And at the bottom, in association with World Association for Public Opinion Research, way poor. And that gave us the 25,000 that let us continue to operate with the black instead of a red line. Thought you would find it interesting. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Uh, I know you've got to be very proud of where the journal is today. Uh, we saw a slide during the uh, business meeting this morning where the impact factor for IJ Poor continues its ascendancy. ascendancy. It's uh, becoming a very uh, highly cited uh, publication in the social sciences, and you have a lot to be proud of there. Thank you, sir. So we are going to move on to our, our third uh, presenter. Oh, I forgot the one I told you I was going to do. We have uh, uh, we have two presenters. We uh, Alejandro Moreno and Manuel Sanchez Castro at ITAM University in Mexico will be presenting a paper disseminating the science of polling, the IJOR in the 1940s. Alejandro, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, and it's a big honor to be here with Tom and Bob and uh, uh, Murray and all our participants, thank you. Well, we um, are talking about the dissemination of public opinion uh, polls uh, in the International Journal of Opinion and Attitude Research, which was the forefather to the IJPOR, which we just uh, heard from Bob. Um, IJOAR, I'm going to call it the journal, so I don't complicate with the acronym. Um, published 20 issues from 1947 to 1951. And we wanted to analyze what happened there, what was said, who said it, and how this may have impacted on the profession. Uh, as you probably know, uh, and unfortunately my colleague, Manuel Sanchez Castro, I just spoke with him. He will not be joining us, but, uh, but he did much of the work and as you know, he's a young ally in my uh, historical revisions of polling. And not only he is a young ally, but we uh, had the fortune to have the help from other very young allies in this one. I think that this has two fantastic effects. One, that you get uh, the younger generations of researchers interested in the history of the profession, but also there is a benefit that um, I found out in uh, doing this, this research, that they bring their new tools for analysis. 
So uh, what we did was to put the 20 issues of the um, journal, the International Journal of Opinion and Attitude Research into a, some sort of, um, for me, black box, but it's called in, in artificial intelligence tools, particularly the natural language processing. And we found a lot of things. And it was actually fun. If you go into the presentation, which I uh, encourage you to do, which is recorded in the, in the site, um, Manuel gives us a very good uh, uh, perspective of the tool, getting to see how, uh, well, basically four things that we look at. How were the networks of researchers and academic institutions developed? during the 1947-1951 uh, publication of the journal. What's the geography of the contents? And all this is interactive. We don't know how to put this interactive thing into an eventual paper, but if you look at the presentation that was recorded, you can have a taste of the fun that it can be to, to look at this history with the new tools. Of course, we look at the numbers, number of articles published by year, and also, and very importantly, the contents. Just to summarize, I think that the evolution or the development of the journal, when you look at, at it through the networks using these artificial intelligence tools, it is very clear how uh, the profession gets integrated globally, how uh, different names of researchers are part of central nodes of networks and some others may not be possibly because of language, not necessarily geography. But for example, this uh, analysis lets us see how the German uh, profession, as, uh, as well as the Japanese profession, are islands of self-references, while others like the Great Britain and United States are in the middle of a growing network, network of scholarship. So this is interesting per se. We have to uh, see uh, what it means. Um, of course, the geography of the contents uh, tells us how basically the main research from the journal came from Great Britain and the United States, but it included many other uh, regions. For example, in the second level of publications, it's interesting to see how the Soviet Union is present in the journal. And also in a lower level, but in, uh, interesting publications from China, India, and even Cuba, who uh, some research researchers from Cuba used to send reports on public opinion to the journal and publish them. The journal had articles, but also reports on public opinion and reports on the profession. So this is really interesting. And Tim, I'm looking at the at the uh, slides. So, uh, obviously, we are. I don't. I don't think I can um, share them here, but. You are more than welcome to look at them. They are uploaded in the site. And the reason why I saw this is because you can have an idea of the nodes and networks and also the geography, how we uh, put it together with some graphs. But the journal was not always the official journal of the um, um, Wayport uh, from 1947 to 1948. This means almost uh, two years. It ran independently, and you can see actually 1948. Uh, there, are, there are some examples of the notes. We can pass that if you want. I, although I have to say that these notes are really interesting to see in the presentation that was recorded by Manuel. And uh, here is the, the, the global distribution. Uh, again, as I was saying, um, the, the colors here for you to, to identify purple, which is the United States and Great Britain are the places where we have the most publications in the journal. There is the Soviet Union as, in a second place, along with other countries from uh, Europe, Germany amongst them. And uh, then you can see vast emptiness from Africa, a little bit from Latin America, mainly Mexico, Brazil, Venezuela. Mexico was a special place here because it, the journal was edited in Mexico City by a uh, Hungarian professor, Laszlo Ratani, whom in the past we have documented as much as we can, his role in uh, um, developing the journal, but also developing public opinion research in Mexico. If we can go to the next one, Tim, please. 
You can see in purple the non-official issues of the journal uh, as, a, as the main uh, journal of Wayport. The blue ones are the main uh, uh, official journal of Wayport. It's interesting to see how the number of articles in 1948 grows because it was uh, a special issue that devoted to the um, let's say to, to the debacle of polls in the 1948 election and this is this is something that of course there are many things to say and despite the fact that there are more articles they were shorter articles we could go to the next one if you could uh, tim you can see the uh, uh, how the number of words decreases um, mm. uh, in 1948. So these were more articles with less words, and this was something that we analyzed. So uh, just to prepare the finishing, let me go to the last uh, few slides, which I think are the most interesting, um, not because the, the development of networks is not, but uh, many of the names in the networks are difficult to identify. As I was listening to Bob uh, bringing up names from, from those years, there are really many names that come up in our analysis that perhaps are forgotten or uh, we don't know much about. And our, our, our goal is to try to um, uh, put them back in the map and see what they said, who they were, where they come from. In terms of uh, the university networks, for example, it's, it's very interesting to see how the University of Denver Chicago, Princeton, and the University of Michigan were already in the center of the networking. They were uh, referenced uh, in, in the world of polling. But again, this is, I think, very interesting because we ran in this using these artificial intelligence tools, what is called an intertopic inter distance map. And it gave us four dimensions of issues from the, from the journal. The first dimension, has to do with the issues themselves. What were the main topics that were uh, um, addressed in the journal? And as you can see, we have a long list which starts with war. Uh, of course, World War II was important here, uh, and the study and prejudice, war, uh, and, and different words here that you can see from uh, government to propaganda to uh, sociology. So this is one first look at the um, main words that were being analyzed. This is, this is something that comes as the first dimension in the issue. The second dimension, which is the next slide, shows you what we could call the profession. Besides the issues, the second main uh, um, topics was about the profession and the methodologies used by it. You can see, for example, on the top, the word bias, then errors, then pollsters, then NORC is right there, Gallup, the, the, the profession, market training, staff job, prediction, which is the topic that we were uh, discussing in the previous, uh, uh, in the keynote by Marco Lagos. Uh, and so on. So this is this is a second uh, dimension besides the issues that comes the profession. A third one has to do with the methodology. And here you find words like test, scores, intensity, correlations, uh, also uh, groups, Jews, etc. So uh, belief, mean, variables. So there is a third dimension in which the dissemination of the science of polling focused on the methodological issues. Then a final, not because it's final, but, but the next dimension, uh, which is the fourth most important one uh, uh, derived from the analysis, has to do with politics and journalism. What uh, the polls began to show in the early issues of the journal was this dimension that is so important today that has to do with the dissemination of results and politics, like presidential approval, like elections, and many other uh, things that have to do with how much uh, population support uh, politicians and policies. We can see in the list Truman, newspaper, news, recorded. Also, for some reason, here comes women. Uh, uh, it, it shows in the issues, but here is more prevalent. 
city sponsorship, German democratic, and so on. Dewey, for example, of course, the 1948 election was, was important in that sense. So as you can see, this analysis is taking us back to one, just to try to summarize the whole thing, team. Number one, how the profession was interacting, how they referenced each other in the journal, how this interaction grew in a global scale, as we almost cannot imagine uh, from some places like China and Cuba, reporting on public opinion polls and democracy before uh, the respective revolutions in those countries. Two, how uh, the universities and institutions played in that global interaction, how that global interaction looked. The global interaction is particularly fun to look at in the maps that are actually interactive. Again, I will reference to uh, Manuel's presentation. It took 15 minutes, one from me, 14 from him. So we will have lots of details. And again, what was said, how important was the profession, the methodology, the issues, the groups, what we call identity politics today was very present back then in some, in some uh, sort of uh, a form. And of course, the main uh, uh, reason for polling today, which has to do with the dissemination in journal, uh, in the newspapers and media, and now social media, which is how it took place in politics and journalism. So eventually, I think, uh, Bob, Tom, this can be a written piece. It will be hard to see how uh, the interactive part can be put like that. but. We'll find a way. And again, thank you for including us in this very, very interesting uh, remembrance and, and uh, uh, valuing of our history. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Our fourth uh, uh, presentation uh, by Murray Goot at Macquarie University in Australia, From America to Murdoch's Australia, A Transnational History of the Gallup Poll. Murray? Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, my paper is not uh, really about Waipor uh, as such as an institution, but, uh, but about one of its early figures, of course, George Gallup. In America, as everyone will know, the Gallup poll was first published in 1935. Keith Murdoch, Rupert's dad, introduced the poll to Australia in late 1941. By 1971, the Gallup poll was a brand in 25 countries. What sort of questions were Gallup polls interested in asking? How did this change over time? And to what extent are the answers the same in every country where the poll flourished? In 1985, Gene Converse and Howard Schumann offered a way to start answering these questions by looking at the forms in which questions had been asked between 1941 and 1971 by the American Gallup poll. Remarkably, their paper identified no fewer than 18 forms of attitude or opinion question. 14 were forms of closed question, four were forms of open question. They also identified knowledge or information questions, interest and involvement questions, and questions of intensity. Other questions that they might have included, however, they excluded questions about respondents' reported experience, questions measuring preferences among candidates, and questions asked more than once. They included a question only when first asked. Their paper examined the questions asked in the US at four points in time, 1941 to 42, 51 to 52, 61 to 62, and 69 to 71. In this paper, I apply their categories to the Australian Gallup poll across the same four periods and compare the result with what Converse and Schumann discovered about the American Gallup poll. I then examine how the pattern for Australia looks if we include the questions that they excluded. And finally, I draw some broad implications of the study. The majority of the questions Gallup asked in America and Australia were binary. The proportions are highlighted in table one, if Tim can put them up, halfway down panel one. Since Gallup insisted that the primary purpose of the Gallup poll was to simulate a referendum, truth to power, if you like, 
And since referendums almost always take the form of a binary choice, binary questions are what one might expect. And they're highlighted down across that uh, total closed binaries. In 1941 to 42, as you can see, the most common type of binary was yes, no, or yes, no implied, uh, with the, uh, the no being the implied bit. However, over time, there is a marked shift to other binary forms in both countries, as the top half of table one shows. In Australia, in 1941-42, yes, no questions made up roughly 40% of all the questions. In 1951-52, they accounted for just 17%. The shift away from yes, no registers as a shift towards approve, disapprove, a lesser shift to the do you think that something or not style of question, and a shift to contrasting arguments around substantive ideas. In the US, yes, no questions accounted for half the questions asked in 41, 42, as you can see, but for less than a tenth of all the questions asked just 10 years later. In the US, the shift shows up mostly in a move away from binary choices of any kind, something scarcely evident in Australia. Gallup believed that poll questions should be as brief and to the point as possible, since the more words included in the question, either by way of explanation or in stating alternatives, the greater the possibility that the question wording itself will influence answers. Long format choices, as Converse and Schumann define them, are two-way choices where at least one alternative is phrased in five words or more. Not much used, these were more common in the US than in Australia. By contrast, a choice between two rival arguments was quite common in Australia and less common in the US. There, the frequency of such questions almost halved after 1941-42. Gallup's injunction to keep it brief and to the point may help explain the relatively low proportion of closed non-binaries which show up at the bottom half of panel one. Entirely absent are Likert type questions and questions with rival arguments and scaled responses. Again, as you'll see, absent are questions involving uh, other scales with four or more points, questions that pose three or more arguments or that pose three way choices in a long format are almost as rare. Questions with checklists of four or more items used more often in Australia are slightly more common. Among the closed binaries, much the most common were the short three-way choices, category seven, you'll see seven there. Questions that offered several alternatives raised a number of concerns for Gallup, apart from their length. The difficulty of finding alternatives that were mutually exclusive, the difficulty of finding a series that covered the entire range of options, the problem of wording each alternative in a way that doesn't give it a special advantage, and in any series of alternatives that ranges from one extreme of opinion to another, he insisted, the typical citizen has a strong inclination to choose one in the middle. Though furthest removed from Gallup's model of the mini referendum, open-ended questions didn't pose any of these problems. In the US, as panel two shows, the proportion of open-ended questions, including those that could be pre-coded, remained fairly constant between 15 and 16% across the four periods. Not in Australia. After 51-52, the use of open-ended questions that were not pre-coded faded away. Questions that asked for reasons why and questions that, pro that probed answers scarcely registered. What are the other questions noted in the middle of panel two? Interest or involvement? questions. Have you read or heard about the recent COP26 meeting in Glasgow would be an example, were twice as prominent in the US in 51-52 as they had been in 41-42, and this level of prominence was maintained. But in Australia after 51-52, such questions were little used. Public opinion was simply assumed to exist. 
Preston's attested knowledge and information increased in the US in 51, 52, fell away, then rose again. In Australia, such questions again were little used. As for questions of intensity, they were hardly used in the US or in Australia. In 1947, Gallup famously proposed what he called a quintimensional approach to polling. He proposed that in addition to being asked a yes or no question, respondents should be asked a filter or information question, a question allowing an open or free answer, a question seeking to learn the reasons why persons in the sample hold the views they do, and questions designed to measure the intensity with which opinions are held. On the evidence of table one, none of this had more than the most marginal impact on how the Gallup poll was conducted, either in the US or in Australia. While the converse and Schumann coding frame is valuable, there is an overwhelming case for expanding it to include all the questions the polls ask and for which they report the answers. Why omit questions about candidate and I assume party preference when these things may be the most important things that polls do? Why omit questions that are repeated when their repetition may tell us something about the poll's own agendas or offer us an insight into how prominent a particular social or political issue might have been? And why omit questions around personal experience, home ownership, the holding of a vehicle license, membership of the trade union and so on, when these questions not only form part of the poll's repertoire, but can also serve other very useful purposes. Where the results can be checked against official data, reports on any of these things afford us another way of examining the quality of a poll sample. And in the absence of official data, questions about how many people can swim, how many gamble, how many are teetotalists and so on, may help fill gaps in our knowledge about a country that can't otherwise be filled. The results of incorporating all the questions asked by the Australian Gallup poll are shown here in table two. For 1941-42, the impact of this sort of inclusiveness is minimal. There were no repeat questions. Of the lifestyle questions, there was just three, and there were very few questions about respondents' voting intentions or voting behaviour. But by 1951-52, the impact is large. It turns out that the questions coded using the Converse and Schumann frame account for only two thirds of all the questions the polls actually asked in Australia. There were repeat questions to add. There was an explosion in the number of lifestyle questions. No fewer than 21% of the questions asked were of this kind. And the number of questions about respondents' voting intentions or previous voting behaviour tripled. In 61-62, the proportion of the polls questions covered by the original coding frame remained roughly the same, about 70%, but repeat questions reached 13%, the proportion about voting behaviour increased, and the proportion of lifestyle questions was halved. Again, in 69-71, the proportion of questions included in the original coding frame was little changed, but the proportion of repeated questions continued its upward trajectory the proportion of lifestyle questions dropped again by half, and the proportion of questions about voting behaviour also slipped. How this more inclusive approach affected the overall distribution of question forms is a story that Table 3 tells. Two takeouts from Table 3. One, binaries continue to eclipse any other category of question, but they are now a much lower proportion than the figures produced by the original coding. Two, while opinion questions account for almost all the questions in 41, 42, thereafter they account for only two thirds to three quarters of all the questions asked. Three conclusions. First, while some forms of questioning were used more than others and favored forms changed over time, the patterns in the US and Australia weren't always the same and the changes didn't necessarily occur at the same time. This raises questions of a different order, including those about the limits of transnationalism, the effect of different political cultures on polling, the agency of individual pollsters in selecting question forms, and the nature and ubiquity of the so-called Gallup method. Second, the substantial proportion of opinion questions asked by Gallup that do not take a binary form 
heavily qualifying Gallup's claim that the Gallup poll was essentially about conveying public opinion to the powerful via many referendums. And finally, the substantial proportion of lifestyle questions heavily qualify the poll's image as simply an opinion poll. This is something that the Converse and Schumann schema in its original version serves only to obscure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Murray, for that presentation. I think I got the slides right, or the tables yeah, right. So, sure. <laughs> so uh, we, we have about five minutes uh, for uh, questions. I have a thing that I spoke to you about the other night. Sure, Rob. Bob. Uh, when I counted up the number of uh, top dogs, uh, we found 30 men and seven women. Mm. I think there has been a uh, an increase. Well, I know there's been an increase uh, later in the 37 than in the early ones. Uh, and I have no idea who this uh, Dodd lady is, was, then I'd love to know, that uh, was the secretary and treasurer and a lot of other things, it seems, in the early days. So I don't know if anybody knows about her, but uh, it'd be interesting to see if, uh, if there's some uh, interesting things in the whole set of the people that we know. Thanks, Bob. Uh, other questions? We have just about two minutes. I see uh, Heineck has his hand raised. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting overview of all these presenters. That was fascinating for me. Uh, but one uh, small question. Uh, you spoke about uh, vapor. Uh, you spoke uh, about UNESCO. Uh, you spoke about uh, some other institution. Uh, but uh, in the same time, uh, in the years 1949, 50, uh, and, and uh, before and after, there were some other uh, institutions. And I would like to know some uh, connections between them. For example, uh, AAPOR. Uh, I know that you are very experienced uh, in America about the history of that uh, uh, in, in for that uh, institution, but uh, we in Europe uh, know uh, only something. And the other things, uh, for example, uh, in 1949 was uh, set up a, a sociological association, International Sociological Association, uh, as I know in uh, uh, in uh, um, Oslo, uh, and uh, I am interested in the connection between personalities and networks of this institution, if, if you know something. I'm not sure if any of the panel members can speak to those connections. There certainly are, particularly WAPOR and APOR, but also, as you mentioned, ISA and, and UNESCO. Mm. Jim, uh, let me say one thing. Um, Waypoint in particular, as I mentioned, uh, had great hopes that UNESCO and other units in the UN would take and support a worldwide establishment of polling. They pursued that for about 20 years. It never happened. And um, in large part because UNESCO's own resources were so small and they covered everything of which public opinion survey research was only one small little piece. And uh, while they, and, and so uh, that was very actively pursued. And uh, I'm going to be in another venue writing up more on how they collaborated, but it, basically all petered out by the 1960s and disappeared as a meaningful connection. One thing that, that uh, 
the one thing that started early and continued was Gallup International. I, I was going to say the same. Yeah. Yes, sorry, Marie. Yes. Yeah. No, yes. Yes, because uh, Shenstead Sell, the first president, was from Gallup International. Then very few presidents afterwards, Jan Stapel, uh, Eric Dakota from India, uh, Hans Setterberg, they were all from Gallup International. Yeah. Even though George Gallup was never president. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, no, but he would have been instrumental in organizing, you know, all of the, well, most of the uh, affiliated gallops asking the same question at the same time in different countries. Yes, the uh, third, uh, third conference in, of survey researchers ever held was of Gallup Institutes in Lockwood, uh, England. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then basically that evolved into annual meetings of the Gallup International then. Uh, and uh, the uh, spin-off of uh, Ropers was the other major international organization in the early years, but Gallup was the dominant one uh, in the for, for the first 20 years, really. Yeah. And some of the affiliates didn't always ask the question, in the same way, uh, because they objected to the way the question had been uh, drafted. There's an instance of that, certainly in Australia around the Vietnam War. Good. I think we've run out of time. I want to thank all of our speakers uh, for their, their really interesting presentations today. Uh, one of our long-term projects is to construct a monograph that uh, faithfully records uh, Waypour's first 75 years of history. And uh, uh, all the information presented today, hopefully will we'll go into that, uh, into that monograph. So thank you all so much. Uh, th there are two events coming up. There is a poster session being hosted by Michael Traugott, and there is a national representatives meeting being hosted by Robert Chung. They're both about to uh, uh, commence right now. And if we don't see you there, hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow at uh, the second day of the Wayport Conference. Thank you all again. Thank you, so Tim. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Excuse me, it's, it's 3 a.m. in Sydney. I'm oh. going back to bed. You need to, you need to go back to bed. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>